Fun Ideas Productions presents the Fun Ideas Podcast. If you're unhappy most of the time, and you're indoors when the sun begins to shine, you're bogged down with responsibility when the good sun shines, you can come out with Hi, this is Mark Arnold. Welcome to Fun Ideas Podcast number 255. I will be at the Mid Valley Comic Art Expo in Salem, Oregon on April 20th and 21st, and Shortbox Live in San Jose, California on May 5th, signing copies of my new Turtles book and new Mad books. <coughs> How do you do? The purpose of this recording is to introduce you to my new book set called Unconditionally Mad. Part 1 and Part B. First, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mark D. Arnold, and I am the writer of Unconditionally Mad. (laughs) It's my job. My name is Mark D. Arnold, and I am the writer of Unconditionally Mad. It's my job to... I am the writer of Unconditionally Mad, and it's my job... (laughs) What's so funny about that? Well, anyway, here's William M. Gaines, Harvey Kurtzman, Jack Davis, Wally Wood, Bill Elder, Al Feldstein, Norman Mingo, Kelly Freeze, Bob Clark, Frank Jacobs, Don Martin, Don Edwin, Paul Coker, Nick Meglin, Dave Berg, George Woodbridge, Mort Drucker, Al Jaffe, Dick DeBartolo, Sergio Aragones, Angelo Torres, Tom Bunk, John Ficarra, Tom Richmond, Desmond Devlin, Sam Viviano, Johnny Sampson, Bill Morrison, Susie Slab, and many more. And here's the publisher, Bear Manor Media. (laughs) Available now through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or Bear Manor Media. The Fun Ideas Podcast is brought to you in part by Freaky Magazine. I contribute material to every issue, so give it a try. Hey, kids. Have you read Freaky? The magazine of weird humor for freaks like you. Freaky Magazine is a way out collection of weirdo comics, kooky gags, photo funnies, social satire, and surreal collage. 52 pages of insanity in the tradition of magazines of yore like Cracked, Blob, and Zap. Special offer for Fun Ideas listeners. Get a free sample copy in the mail. Made of smelly newsprint and smudgy ink the old-fashioned way. Just message your mailing address to theslowpoisoner at gmail.com. That's theslowpoisoner at gmail.com while supplies last. Friends, have you tried Lee's Comics? Lee's Comics is better than the leading comic book store. Wait a minute. Lee's Comics is the leading comic book store, based on arbitrary standards set by Lee Hester himself. Lee's Comics was named as one of the 21 best online dealers by PopOptique.com. To shop the Lee's Comics eBay store, go to eBay and search for Lee's Comics, Inc. That's L-E-E-S-C-O-M-I-C-S-I-N-C, period. Don't forget the period. Mention the Fun Ideas podcast when you order and you'll receive a free bonus gift. Hey, hey, it's Charles Rosene from the Monkeys Interview Show here on Monkey Mania Radio. So proud to announce the release of a brand new book called Not Just Happy Together, The Turtles from A to Z. That's right, the other band besides our monkeys who should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, The Turtles, a great new book that's a discography. It's got interviews, it's got reviews, it's got everything you might want to read about. 
if you're a 60s fan like I am and love the Beatles and the Monkees and the Turtles, not just Happy Together has a front cover and a back cover by Henry Diltz, a forward by Gary Puckett, and it's published by Genius Music Books, an imprint of Genius Book Publishing, now available from www.not just happy together.com hope you pick it up i know you're gonna love it and uh, enjoy all the stuff about the turtles thank you for listening to monkey mania radio hey hey in fun ideas productions news unconditionally mad part one and part b are out as is not just happy together the turtles from a to z am radio to zappa currently i'm working on tv cartoons that time forgot and a new book called The Magazine That Dared to be Dumb, The History of Crazy Magazine. All of my books are available through Amazon or Barnes & Noble, and most are available through Bear Manor Media. The Turtles book is through Genius Publishing. On today's show, we have a guest who publishes a blog about books published about the Beatles called Buzz's Beatle Book Print Blog Archives at BeatlesBookstore.com. Here he is. John Bazzini. Hi, this is Mark Arnold with another episode of Fun Ideas Podcast. And on today, uh, on today's show, I should say, we have Beatles fan extraordinaire, <laughs> John Bazzini, who writes his own uh, blog called Buzz's Beetle Book Print Blog. Is that correct, sir? That, that is correct, sir. Okay. And how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Okay. And I'm looking forward to speaking with you because I've, uh, I've, watched a couple of your own uh, YouTube uh, podcasts, and I've enjoyed them immensely. Mm -hmm. Now, how did we get into contact? I mean, I know you know our mutual friend Charles F. Rosenay, and then suddenly I, I got on your mailing list somehow, which is fine, you know? <laughs> and then now we're you know here well, communicating now. I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, well, it, one of the particular goals for my blog is to recruit as many Beatle book authors uh, as I possibly can. Ah, okay. And I realized, too, uh, that uh, not only do you do the, the, the numerous podcasts, but you've also written a, a Beatles book yourself. Right. And I recently bought uh, your uh, book that you did with Charles Rosenay, not just happy together, which is a fabulous book about the turtles. And I wasn't never a re I mean, I loved the turtles' music, but I didn't know that much about them. And I took a chance. And what a massive book! It's like getting a copy of the Bible. And, it is. <laughs> uh, I I was amazed. It was a it's a fantastic book, and you should both be proud of yourselves. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, it was a massive undertaking. It took about three years. Um, the the backstory on it, if you don't know, or if you do know, I'll just repeat it just for our listeners, uh, is Charles and I became fast friends once we both appeared together on Plastic EP's show in Australia. And I knew about him way back in the good day sunshine days, but uh, I never knew him personally. And I um, so we got to talking offline and stuff like that and uh, talking about books and stuff like that. And I had already done my Beatles book, Mark Arnold Picks on the Beatles, and at least one, or if not both, of the Monkees books I did with Michael Ventrella. So Monkees and Beatles are kind of like Charles's sweet spot. But we started talking, is there any other group that both of us like that we'd like to do a book on? And we were throwing different names and things out, and we thought about even doing Three Dog Night, which still might be a possibility someday, and Raiders and blah, blah. And then uh, I said, you know, a group that I really like that I don't seem that nobody else likes is the Turtles. And Charles goes, I love the Turtles! <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. And so that's where that came from, and uh, it went from there. And uh, I knew far more than he did, as he will say when we've done interviews together. He says, "I need you on the show with me when I do when we do promotional interviews." And I go, "Why?" He goes, "Because you know everything." <laughs> <And it's> like, <laughs> I wasn't planning to, but I mean, yeah, I guess I'm as versed on the turtles now as almost the Beatles. You know, the Beatles I'm pretty versed on, and and the monkeys, and so. I just learned all this stuff, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great news. But enough about me. Um, how did you become a fan, not just of the Turtles, but, you know, 
of the Beatles and everything else. Are you an original fan that's Ed Sullivan on all that stuff? Yes, yes. It was the Ed Sullivan show, which is about 97% of the first generation fans. Uh, that's probably, if we fit in under that category. Uh, other than the actual people in Liverpool themselves or Hamburg that saw the Beatles at an earlier stage. Uh, but um, it was uh, the Ed Sullivan show. And I really didn't become a collector right away. I mean, I bought the records, mm -hmm. but a pure collector uh, came several years later uh, after they made the transition from their early style uh, to, uh, you know, the radical change which occurred with Rubber Soul, Revolver, Sgt. Pepper, etc. That's when I really started going deeply into collecting. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a question I don't think I've ever asked my dog. If you hear, my, that's my dog shaking. <laughs> uh, uh, here's a question I've never asked original fans. Uh, see, by the time I became a fan, it was 1977, I had heard of the Beatles, but when I became a fan, they were long gone and long established. So when did Beatlemania, as it were, switch from, hey, I like these guys when they appear on my TV set or at the movies or um, a new record comes out to where I want to know like every single solitary bit of everything they've ever done ever. <laughs> <laughs> when did that kind of change? Because that doesn't necessarily happen every day with everybody. That's true. It evolved through time. Yeah. But uh, I think that happened post-breakup. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, where people, you know, they, they that, see, that's another thing. The Beatles were the beneficiaries of great timing mm -hmm. in terms of even whether it was intended or not to make the right decisions at the right time. They broke up at the end of the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul filed his uh, lawsuit in April of 1970 and left the audience wanting for more. And that feeling among hardcore Beatle fans continues to this day. And mm -hmm. that's why, I mean, look at the success of the recent Now and Then, uh, where it actually attained another number one single for them, uh, in the UK. Didn't go as high in the US, but uh, it still made top 10. And it's almost up to 47 million views uh, since uh, November 2nd mm -hmm. on YouTube. And I think that feeling that you alluded to or were referring to uh, began when fans were never really fully uh, sure of whether the possibility existed of them reforming and coming back with new material. Right. And, uh, and you know, that was answered for us in 1980 when, of course, John yeah. was killed. And, um, but the love of the band is cross-generational. Right. And I kind of felt that that was the case. There's only two, two really passions I have, uh, main passions. One is a collecting passion for the Beatles, and in baseball, I love the Yankees oh, okay. and their history. So I kind of, like, when, uh, when I was rooting, I was rooting for people that were at the top of their profession. And, of course, the Yanks had the 28 World Championships, and, uh, and I, I just liked their, their striving for uh, being the best. Didn't always attain that, but <laughs> <laughs> in any case, that's, uh, I, I guess my judgment was pretty good in terms of uh, what history bore out as the truth. <laughs> right. Now, um, you're from New York then, or are you from somewhere else? No, I've lived my entire life in Connecticut. Connecticut, okay. So, uh, but it's, it's still an East Coast thing, I guess. And it, well, Would the Yankee Stadium be the closest to Connecticut? I don't know my ge geography. Well, it's about a two-hour drive from where I live. Okay. How does that equate to, say, like, stadiums of the past, like Shea Stadium or Brooklyn or whatever? Well, the actual very first game that I ever attended was a, was a Mets game back in 1962, the year that I believe <laughs> the Mets started, and it was in the old polo ground. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> but <laughs> so <laughs> is all that like two hours away? So it's all, nothing's close to Connecticut, I guess, right? <laughs> But it's the whole tri-state area, you right, know. Uh, right. It's funny about New York, though. I, I love it. I love to visit it. Mm -hmm. But as terms of living there, I still prefer like a suburban environment where I can go to the local park and there's trees in my backyard, right. deer running <laughs> through the backyard. And, you know, I just enjoy that. So I could never live in a big city. Right. Okay. I get it. But I, I've done both. Um, I grew up in uh, San Jose area and a little bit in Southern California. Uh, and then I lived 10 years in San Francisco. And that was my equivalent of living in New York. Um, I did visit New York and in your neck of the woods a couple times over the years. And I'll be back there in August when I go to my Liverpool trip. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> And you're uh, going to have a great time. Charles Rosen puts on a great uh, uh, annual event well, trip to Liverpool and London. You'll, <laughs> you'll have a fabulous time, I guarantee it. But um, I always think I could live in New York if it wasn't so expensive, you know, mm -hmm. but who knows? You know, it's like at this point I'm in Oregon, and that's even more rural than probably where you are. So it's like, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> I've gone all over the map, I think, you know, so I've experience big city life and you know now not so big city life but hey it's fun um wow. let's see so when did uh your beatles obsession as it were for lack of a better term uh go to the level where it prompted you to well i assume you were be reading beatles books before this blog right yes yeah and yes. what prompted the blog i guess is a better question well, the blog, this will be an interesting story, especially for people that are Facebook aficionados. Mm -hmm. um, I had kind of a run-in with Facebook <laughs> uh, because of their algorithmic-based uh, means or ways to do business or to operate. Mm -hmm. uh, I had built up a membership on a Beatles site on Facebook called Beatles in Print Together in Solo. And within a very short time, I had built it up to more than 5,200 uh, members, mm -hmm. including many Beatles book authors, uh, hardcore Beatles fans. Uh, I wanted to, uh, the ideal impetus or reasoning for the site was to be able to be an information-based uh, forum for people to view the massive amounts of Beatles literature that's available out there in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I tried to stress, too, many of the rarer books or more obscure books that I had obtained in my collection mm -hmm. over the years. Because to this day, Mark, I still encounter books that I never knew existed. <laughs> and those hold up, because uh, I heard an interview with you a while back saying that, you know, you love Beatles books, but you can't or you wouldn't collect them all because some are clearly better than others. Yeah. And that's, that's a logical and true statement. However, I collect... Uh, even some of the bad books, <laughs> because, because to me it illustrates the whole range of ways people can present their story in terms of identifying how they can get things literally uh, virtually 100% wrong. <laughs> and, and, you know, no author, including, and I say this with all the respect in the world because I love his writing and he's the best in regards to the Beatles, yeah. even Mark Lewison is capable and has gotten things wrong. No. <laughs> okay? Oh, I mean, you're ruining my illusion. That sounds, that sounds like sacrilege. Yeah, yeah. But it is the case, and he's admitted it himself. Yeah. But he's limited to to his sources and whether his sources I mean he tries to check everything oh, yeah. but you know people are giving him as well as facts they're giving them him their perceptions 
And perceptions can often change over time. You can have two or three people sitting in the same room watching the same event, and then they all walk away with different points of stress as to what they saw or what they didn't see. Right. And so that's why I collect, uh, because if, if the, here's the test for me if I actually go and buy a book. Mm -hmm. Does the book even provide a tad bit of information that I may not have known before? And that, to me, is my primary motivation when I purchase a book, because it, I look at the whole Beatles story as a puzzle or a jigsaw puzzle. Some pieces fit and some do not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's, but there are certain authors, by the way, that are to me uh, better than others, mm -hmm. or I shouldn't say better than others. <laughs> they present the Beatles story in a better way than others. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I could tell you, uh, I could give you a few examples of who I'm talking about. Sure. Uh, if you like. Uh, well, for example, uh, the obvious one is uh, Mark Lewison. He yeah. does his research, and you know something? My big wish is that I am still alive <laughs> when when Volume 3 is released to the public. I think Volume because 2. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, and you know, I understand his motivation. Yeah for uh, doing it this way because he wants to get the story as correct as possible. Oh, yeah. But there's also a danger that the primary audience for that book is the baby boom, uh, you know, post-war uh, uh, generation. And we're beginning to die off now right. or pass away. And there's a lot of people, I mean, I had two close friends that passed away, and uh, you know, the time uh, waits for no one. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, hey, that's uh, Rolling Stones. Cut it out. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but uh, uh, I mean, there's so many categories of Beatles books. Right. Uh, for example, um, photography books. Mm -hmm. uh, Henry Grossman. Uh, who is who's no longer with us? Uh, my two favorite Beatles uh, photography books, for example, are Kaleidoscope Eyes mm -hmm. and Places I Remember. Now, Kaleidoscope Eyes has an interesting story about it. It was limited to only nineteen hundred and sixty-seven co numbered copies, wow. signed copies, and. That's another collecting obsession. By the way, some people may say, well, hardcore collectors are just victims of being afflicted with OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, because when I collect a limited edition book, uh, like the Grossman book, which I just referred to, mm -hmm. I always ask the publishers if it's possible to buy the last numbered copy of of the limited edition. Hmm. You may say, well, why do you ask for the last one and rather than the first one? <laughs> and, well, because I know that after that last numbered copy, there aren't going to be any more made. Right. A and I know that buying number one is a virtual impossible task since it's usually reserved uh, either for the family that produces the book or for, I mean, you have to be there right when they go on sale, and often that's not possible to do. So, um, I mean, people may say, well, isn't the first copy worth more? That may be true, uh, but I've gone the other route and said, can I have the last one? And I was able to purchase... Copy number 1967 of hmm. that book, and which is neat because I also draw another uh, conclusion to that. The book was um, 
Uh, the numbered copy was indicative of 1967, which was possibly they may have reached the peak of their career with the release of Sgt. Pepper. And the book itself is a chronological uh, photographic essay of Henry Grossman's uh, photographs of a single day where he traces their recording of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Mm. And um, he released another one uh, featuring literally thousands of photographs he had taken of them called Places I Remember, which sort of traced them throughout their entire career. And the collecting aspect, uh, too, Mark, it has a lot to do with collecting the more obscure items, uh, print items associated with the Beatles. Mm -hmm. For example, there was an Asian edition of Life magazine mm -hmm. released in 1967, July, I believe, of 1967, mm -hmm. uh, that featured one of Henry Grossman's Sgt. Pepper photographs on the cover of Life magazine. And for some reason, it only appeared in the Asian edition hmm. and did not appear anywhere else, including America and the UK, which I found very, very strange. But right. to find that issue now, you can you you could talk uh, in the ballpark of spending two hundred to three hundred or four hundred dollars for a copy of that issue, wow. and um, and other authors. Uh, we were the whole focus of this was uh, authors that I extremely respect and admire. Ken Womack, uh, who has produced numerous Beatle titles, and he's done uh, the recent Mal Evans biography, right. and that is going to be followed this year with Volume Two uh, from that book, um, which is I'm sure is going to be superb. Bruce Spitzer who has produced numerous titles that I love. Oh, yeah. uh, again, uh, a gentleman who does his research and does it well. Yeah. Uh, Chip Mattinger, who has written one of the best uh, definitive uh, uh, analyses of the, the recorded uh, solo output of John Lennon. Mm-hmm. Uh, superb book, superb. Uh, Ken McNabb, who has done a couple of uh, books, one about the end of the Beatles and one about the Beatles in Scotland. But, you know, it's funny. A little funny story is the fact that whenever you look out there, and there's, there's more than 2,000 available books, <laughs> uh, English language books on the Beatles, is you keep asking yourself, what uh, what other angle could they possibly be writing uh, right. uh, more biographical information or whatever on the Beatles? Mm -hmm. But they still keep turning up, and everybody that seemed to have a, even a remote uh, association or encounter with them is writing a book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've interviewed <laughs> a few people on my podcast here, you know, that they've written books about their own personal encounters or books of other people's personal encounters, you know. And, yeah. and it's amazing some of the stories that turn up. And that's yeah. what I meant to you about how I personally justify my purchase of a book that may not appeal to really a mass audience yeah. is the fact I'm learning something that I never knew before. Yeah. And there's there's even strange books. If you go to if you go to my blog and you look back at some of the older posts on there, mm -hmm. there's a real strange one. There's a minimalist poet called Aram Saroyan, <laughs> and he wrote a Beatles book at uh, I believe at the height of their their fame and all that. And the entire book is only four pages long. Mm -hmm. He signed the book, and it's. The first page is John, is, has written on it John Lennon. Mm -hmm. Second page, Paul McCartney. Third <laughs> page, George Harrison. Fourth page, Ringo Starr. <laughs> and and he they printed up three hundred I think three hundred copies, fifty of which were signed. 
And <laughs> they actually were, could justify that in their own minds, that this, <laughs> this was minimalist poetry, and that book is out there, and I bought one, and I actually spent, you could probably think I was a lunatic for doing this. I spent $40 for it. I've seen it advertised recently for more than $300 on, wow. uh, on eBay. <laughs> Almost sounds like something. <laughs> almost sounds like a book Yoko would do. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. So, but I mean, that goes to show you how bizarre some of these yeah. collecting uh, aspects can be. You yeah. Know? And I don't mean for the materialistic. I just mean for you know, just the the minimalistic. You know, you understood. Yeah. But I just want to explain. Yeah, because people think, oh, she's. An opportunist, well, you know, uh, it's neither here nor there. You know, it's like it's more for her own brand of minimalist art, <laughs> you know, as she's done in the past. So, anyway. Exactly. And there's a fantastic book uh, about her mm -hmm. um, uh, that's out now. And I, I've, you'll have to forgive me because I have so much circulating <laughs> up there in terms of names names are the most difficult thing you know it used to come very quickly to me but now being yeah. close to 70 years old yeah. uh it becomes more difficult to recall names so right. um, well let me ask you this without going into too much details about books um i assume because you've been paying attention to all these that there's more books about the beatles now than ever before correct that is true yeah that it, is true. and it, it averages between 50 and 70 per year wow <laughs> and do you, how do you find out about them do people send you copies or do you just uh scour different publications or blogs or whatever it, it, like you know? I'll, I'll give away a few of my little trade secrets okay uh number one amazon yeah okay amazon i i go there and i um uh i check um uh i you know, the subject line, I, I type in Beatles, and then I organize it by publication date. Hmm. So even pending books appear at the top. Ah, okay. And that's a little, uh, gives me a little edge to see what's up and coming. Mm -hmm. uh, I also, there are certain Beatle fanzines, uh, one run by Bill King called Beetle Fan out yep. of Georgia, mm -hmm. which is superb. He's been operating for more than 30 years. Uh, and it's a fabulous Beatles fanzine. Mm -hmm. And he's a source of uh, many of the books uh, that are coming out. Uh, it's more than 40 years because I've been a subscriber for more than 40 years. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's anyway. great. And, uh, and I'm sure he he will appreciate the ringing endorsement we're both giving him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, there are uh, eBay. Yeah. You'll be surprised sometimes at the treasures you can find. Mm -hmm. I was uh, going through that once, uh, looking for, uh, you know, again, the subject line of Beatles books and all that, and something really obscure came up. Uh, it was a document printed in 1914 of... It was like almost like you know, like uh, when uh, a real estate agent creates uh, something to sell the property uh, as an advance um, uh, promotional piece that details all the advantages of buying the property. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1914, they produced one for three Savile Row, mm -hmm. and it cr it shows inside the history of the building. For example, where the British may have planned to uh, uh, go to the White House or burn the White House in 1812 was was made in that building. The plans were made in that building. I mean, there were all historical information about the creation of that piece of property where, of course, the Beatles performed their last uh, public performance together on the roof. Mm-hmm. And it has all interior photographs of the building and all the various rooms. I sent a couple of the photographs to Tony Bramwell, who worked with the um, 
worked with the Beatles, shooting a lot of their videos, including the Strawberry Fields video promo. And he was identifying the, the rooms like, well, this was my office. This was, you know, based upon the photographs that were being sent to him from 1914. And I purchased this 56-page historical document that had Beatle connections for about $100. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was priceless mm -hmm. because there's no, you know, there's probably no other copies of this in existence. And it's tied in with my love for the Beatles because the the... The uh, Savile Row building is such an historic building, and it was, of course, their corporate headquarters for a short time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those are another one of the side stories that go along with this. But I was telling you about Facebook mm -hmm. and what led to the blog. Uh, and uh, I posted, I was on it for a, a solid two years, and we were getting, you know, many, many new members on a continuous basis. Mm -hmm. Well, one day I uh, posted a, uh, a book that was called The Beatles Sticker Book, <laughs> Yellow Submarine Sticker Book. And all it was, was the cover was all, you know, the, all the uh, Yellow Submarine characters that were in the movie, you know, like the Blue Meanie and uh, uh, the Chief Blue Meanie and, and, of course, the individual Beatles and all that. Mm -hmm. And I posted that with no accompanying text. And before I knew it, I got a, uh, they removed the post. And I got an email mm. notification saying that I had violated community standards <laughs> for, for doing that. And I said, you know, I said, I wrote to them. And of course, you could never get a response from a human being right. from Facebook. It's, you know, because there's so many millions of people on there, they can't give individual attention to people that have concerns. So, uh, I, um, then my next 15 consecutive posts following this incident, I got the same message wow. about violating community. And none of the posts, by the way, had anything controversial about them whatsoever. So, um... And on the, after the 16th post, I attempted one more post, <laughs> and I was blocked from my own Facebook page. Wow. Without giving a reason, without, they literally locked me out, so I couldn't get back on. Hmm. So, I had two fellow co-administrators, which I created another ID, I logged on that way. And they gave me administrator privileges. And I went back on and I posted an explanation to all the members of what was happening. And I says, I have no idea why this is occurring. No one will explain it to me. I says, I just want you to know. So I, at least you have an explanation why the, the you know you cannot get on to the to the page or, or why I can't post anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, so guess what they did then? Mm, they <laughs> removed my explanation to the membership. Oh, brother. Once again, saying it was violating community standards. And it was Facebook doing this, or it was a disgruntled Facebook. fan? Okay, Facebook. <laughs> okay. Facebook. Okay. And. Then they blocked me a second time. Weird. Mm. So I said, that's it. I've had it. Yeah. This is not going to go on. I am not going to be associated. You know, I love Facebook because of what it offers, the interchange with people, communicating back and forth. Right. But I'm not going to deal with something when there's a problem right. and they can't address the problem uh, yeah. to everybody's satisfaction. Because it wasn't, I was certainly wasn't doing anything controversial, and um, 
In any case, I then asked my co-administrators to remove all the membership and archive the site. And somebody I know, David Bedford, who is an author himself and runs a wonderful blog, uh, the Beatles Bookstore, asked me, John, would you be interested? He says, I loved your Facebook page. Would you be interested? Because he knew how de- de- uh, how how anxious and, and uh, uh, sad I was at having, uh, you know, just making the decision to... to permanently leave Facebook, right. he says, how about being a part of uh, the blog? And so we then created uh, a segment uh, specifically dealing with my collection and books, older books, newer books, and the vast array of uh, Beatles-related print material that exists out there, and it's proved to be very successful. And we're looking for not only more authors to join, but hardcore collectors Mm -hmm. and people that just have a general knowledge to learn more about what's out there and what the books do indeed cover or go over. And, uh, you know, uh, there's so many people that have written to me, and it serves as like having a network because they're knowledgeable of things that may have bypassed me. Right. And so, you know, it grows and grows and grows until the point now where um, my house looks probably more like a museum than a home. <laughs> 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 so that was the question I was going to ask you. I mean, do you keep all these books? So you, do you have room yes, for all these but, books? Okay. But I've, been, but I've been forced to box them and store them at another site, Got too. It. Okay. So that's uh, I mean, obviously, you don't, you know, and that's what I mean where the OCD kind of thing comes in. Right. That, you know, you've got to have it functional. Right. You know, of what use is it to have uh, a thousand books and you never read them? You've right. got to be able to be functional as well as enjoyable to have. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, what was my next question about this? Uh Let's see. Well, one of the things you gave me here is a little uh, list of things. Uh, books that still need to be written. <laughs> um, well, and I'm looking at it, and it's like some of them are fascinating. Some of them are like, I don't care. But, you know, um, I'm surprised nobody has uh, written about John and Paul in New York to promote the Apple Tonight show. Yeah. That, and you know something that that in itself caused a little controversy hmm. because when I had the Facebook page, I'll tell you, I'm not going to mention any names, uh, but there was a person that got upset with me because I'd written a little piece that said, "Here's a here's a book that I would love to see somebody write," and the a book idea that mm-hmm. I would love to see somebody write. Mm-hmm. And what I did was I went on the Internet and I found uh, some photographs and they, they, they had no attribution uh, on the sites that I found them, meaning they didn't say who took a photograph or whatever. One uh, of the pictures um, that I posted was a picture of John Lennon, I think, on the cover of I Magazine. Oh, yes. And I posted that photograph because that was taken while he and Paul were in New York. Mm -hmm. And I got someone accusing me that they were going to go see a lawyer for copyright infringement by, by, uh, by posting the photograph of the magazine. Mm. And I'm saying to myself, first of all, this is my copy of the magazine. I, you know, I actually took this photograph from my own personal copy, which I bought off of eBay. I'm not a, intending to infringe on anybody's copy, right? Mm. This is my copy, and this is what my purpose of this is to inform people that there's a magazine out there with a cover story of John Lennon on it from this trip, Mm -hmm. you know? And as it turns out, I mean, out of respect for the lady that said the photograph was taken by her, Mm -hmm. uh, I removed it. 
Mm -hmm. But I got really irritated because I said, you know, where does one draw the line or where is it specified uh, by Facebook what one is allowed to post and what one is not allowed to post based upon the format of the medium? Yeah. And it still, to this day, is a very unclear uh, set of... I don't even know if the rules exist. Right. Uh, and, you know, but in any case, that... Um, uh, when you said you, you weren't aware... No, there are no books mm -hmm. that currently deal with John and Paul's visit in 1968 to promote Apple. And there's so many events that they attended and so many yeah. photographs that exist that they could make a nice book. I mean, I'm sure it wouldn't be a very long book. Right. And many of the people were are now deceased. Yeah. Uh, you know, when they went on that Chinese uh, junk that went around Manhattan, there were numerous photographs taken on that boat, which were mm. very fascinating yeah. to see. And um, they went to a walk through Central Park with their famous cohort, mm -hmm. although someday I'd love to see a book written about him, Magic Alex. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how he could essentially, I'm, to this day, I wonder how could they have been taken in by him. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I always, John uh, was. I always kind thought of, he was a dealer or something. That's that's the only explanation <laughs> I. <laughs> and they had well, to cover up John somehow. In particular was was naive about new things. Yeah. In other words, you know, he had blind faith in someone until they gave him a case right. uh, to think otherwise. Right. But, uh, uh, in any case, uh, of course, they did the Tonight Show. Yeah. With. Uh, um, uh, Joe Garagiola as the host of yeah. all people, uh, baseball uh, announcer and player, former player, and Tahula Bankhead uh, <laughs> was one of the other guests. Yeah. And by the way, no, as far as we know, no finished uh, video yeah. of that pr uh, program exists because NBC essentially erased a lot of those mm -hmm. older programs. It's amazing to me that, you know, well, it's amazing they wiped them out anyway, but uh, on The Tonight Show, but uh, pre-1972, but that they didn't even have the foresight to keep a few just out of general curiosity, like the very first Johnny Carson Tonight Show in 62 only exists in audio. And, you know, this one, which, you know, Beatles didn't, appear much in the late 60s so you'd think somebody would have kept it or recorded it somewhere <laughs> well the, an eight millimeter uh film if you check youtube yeah i've seen that you, and it's you, not the you, best quality yeah. but yeah yeah <laughs> and the complete audio yeah does exist yes it's, i think it's about 20 minutes in length yeah so because yeah. the interesting thing about your books that are needed um uh, I love anything post Pepper uh, when it comes to Beatles uh, through their breakup because by that point they were like really to themselves. They didn't. They're kind of tired of the whole game. They didn't want to be around. So any interviews and in, it's like when Beatles anthology came out. It even kind of disappointed me that there was the lack of footage that existed post 67 and you know it probably just doesn't exist it's just uh, well it, ever, since get back came out that's kind of remedied some of it you know <laughs> but uh -huh. you know but it, it's still it's like that's the stuff that really fascinates me so when when you know get back did come out with the length it came out of i was like glued because it's like oh my god it's a lot of footage of the time period we don't know much about <laughs> So, yep. so that whole John and Paul in New York in 68, you know, it's, it's just kind of incredible to me that it doesn't exist. There's not much to it, you know, whatever. There's the audio, at least. I guess that's good. But, you know, <laughs> um, I'm surprised they didn't do more than The Tonight Show. You know, it's like, 
you know, they were in New York already. They could have appeared on Ed Sullivan again, even. You know, <laughs> it's like they yeah. didn't. Yeah. Well, they did do they did do a Larry Kane interview and yeah. another interview with somebody from PBS, I believe. But yeah. uh, again, those are not widely circulated. I think one or two of those may appear on YouTube. Yeah. But, um, and I guess it's, uh, it, I guess it stems back to what you said originally. You know, it's like uh, every little day to day item or the you know the beatles didn't really come out you know or people didn't start paying attention to it until after they broke up so i guess in 68 people just took beatles for granted well, oh yeah they're there think, you know why do you think some of the younger generation people that are now beatles fans they they get some they they seem to be feeling some sense of what did i miss out on yeah because they hear the previous generations talk about, you know, the development of the music and the exciting times. You know, we, we have a tendency to look back when we're being nostalgic to make things better than they actually were. I mean, I lived through the 60s, and it seemed like very exciting times with the moon landing. But we also, you know, we had the Vietnam War and... and uh, but, you know, I'm not so sure it's any different than the chaos that we experience today. Right. Um, but I don't see anything musically equivalent to the mass appeal that, uh, I mean, obviously Taylor Swift is today's, today's equivalent of Beatles sales, but I don't think she has the mass cultural appeal that the Beatles did yeah. uh, because they were cross-generational and um, you know like I said there's so many factors uh, yeah. that figured into that chemistry that made them special yeah. not only timing issues their sense of humor yeah. how the press yeah how they handle the press um, and you know it's uh, like I said, they went out on top. Yeah. So what did they leave people yearning for more? So they couldn't fall off the cliff and decline. Right. And I, I think so, that's the difference. You know, it's like I, I try not to knock Taylor Swift because I get it. You know, she's popular. People like her. So there's no point in doing it. It's just today's version, like you're saying. But the main difference is, and this is what I think solidified me as a Beatles fan, uh, you already said their sense of humor. That'll always draw me to get to somebody. That's why I like monkeys. That's why I like turtles. Um, but the fascinating thing to me that made it all click is all the stuff they did in such a short period of time. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it was so diverse. It wasn't like they did six years of albums that sounded like hard... Di- uh, well, I was going to say hard days. Uh, I want to hold your hand. You know, it was... Uh, six years of uh, albums and singles that went from I Want to Hold Your Hand to I Am the Walrus to, you know, whatever, you know, yeah. it's like, wow, you know, it's like, and um, it, it's it's funny to me, like, you know, you know, using Taylor Swift as an example, um, she does write her own material, she does have quite a diverse catalog, but it generally is like, Here's another album. Here's another album. Here's another album. And uh, if you like it, you'll love it. If you don't, well, it's just more of the same. The only thing she's kind of done is switched from strictly country into more pop, you know, uh-huh. and stuff like that. Where Beatles, uh, they started out totally rock and roll and pop. But then by 68, 69, you know, especially on the White Album, you get a country song, you get, you know... <laughs> All sorts of, you know, types of, you know, you know, different things from Honey Pie to, you know, I want to do it on the road. You know, it goes to avant-garde with Revolution Number 9, you know. And it's like, I can't think of any artists that would do that nowadays. And it's not knocking them. It's, they, they don't even try. I don't know. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, by the way, uh, with the whole book idea, uh-huh. uh I before I meet my own demise, uh, I, I have plans of uh, releasing my own Beatles book to add to the uh, <laughs> <laughs> to the 
to add to the immense library, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, it's uh, it's going to be. I don't want to make it too academic because that will turn people off in terms of the appeal of the book. Mm-hmm. But I want to uh, make it like a psychological study uh, of collecting Beatles memorabilia or Beatles stuff, if you want me to use a more mundane term. <laughs> um, and that is, uh, I've already had a, a um, graphic designer design the cover of the book, and it's a picture of uh, Sigmund Freud in a Beatles wig. And um, I I have to play with the title a little, but it was going to be All You Need Is ID. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, having a dual meaning, the title, with, uh, you know, you need your ID to get in. Mm -hmm. And uh, All You Need Is Id, which is, of course, Freud's... uh, you know, the id, ego, and superego. Right. And it's going to be like a psychological study uh, of what being a Beatle collector is like. <laughs> and, of course, I use the samples from my own collection and tell why people collect, how obsessive they can be, and why do people... See, there, I draw the line certain places, sir. Like, for example, when Paul McCartney came out with the McCartney 3 album, <laughs> he released that LP in literally, it seems like, a hundred different color variations of the LP. Right. I have no desire to collect all 100 versions of a colored LP. My focus is more functional in that role in terms of I just want to get the LP to be able to listen to. Right. So, but I can never understand, you know, the hardcore collector that wants them all. Yeah. And what is it? It's the completest that we have, is a part of, the, of collecting. Yeah. And some people collect because it elevates their own sense of self-esteem. They mm. feel better because they have something that other people want but don't have access to. Right. And so there's so many things that go into a, the psyche <laughs> of collectors, and it differs from person mm-hmm. to person, of course. Yeah. But uh, that's what I want to approach in my book. Yeah. That's interesting. It was, it, like, And I'll use McCartney 3 as an example. I, whenever a new album comes out by any of them, group, solo, or whatever, I always try to figure out what is the best version to get. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because they always put out like 10 different versions. Like it really bugged me. The the trend, it seems like this trend is kind of going away, maybe not. But, you know, it'll be like a, a 10 or 12 track album. But you can get the 15 track album if you go to Target. Or you can get the 16 track album if you buy it through this website or something. So I always try to figure out Where's the one that has the most material on it for the le- least amount of money? <laughs> you know exactly the best and, value for the money. Yeah, exactly. And um, exactly. colored vinyl doesn't do it for me. If I happen to get one, great, okay. Um, but I'm not looking for it. I don't care. You know, it's like in uh, in the case of McCartney three, um, I'm still you know I, I pretty much am a CD guy. I love CDs. Uh, I still have my vinyl albums. And Beatles and Rolling Stones are about the only artists that, if they put out a new album, I'll buy it on vinyl still. But it's only going to be if it's a brand new album. So McCartney 3 I did. Uh, the Revolver box set I did not, because I have Revolver from the 60s. That's that's the one I want. Yeah, so, um, but McCartney 3, I said, oh, I'm not going to go for all these vinyl ones. And so, you know, I bought a copy of what I found, and I think it's just black vinyl, and that's fine. That's what I want. Exactly. Um, the bottom line is, what, what, did we, what do we love? The, uh, we love the artist. For their music, that was right. the primary motivation for all of us to even love the band or love the individual, is because of the work that they produced, right. producing good music. And, and, and <laughs> go ahead. No, I was just, uh, you know, it, it's um, 
There, by the way, you know, I know we're getting close to the end of the uh, the hour, mm-hmm. but um, uh, there were a couple of other quick things I'd like to mention okay. too. Uh, if it, if we have the time. Well, yeah, we're not, we're not strictly an hour. I mean, if we go on a few more minutes, that's fine. I've done four hour okay. shows before. I try not to, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, for example, yeah, uh, yeah. another print element yeah. that I continue to collect yeah. because, uh, and I'll explain why I do this, is I collect the autographs of virtually all the important people that had some association mm-hmm. with the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've even got some really obscure ones like Doug Chadwick. Do you happen to know who Doug Chadwick was? I've heard the name. I'm trying to think. Is he, he wasn't in the Quarrymen or something. What was his... Well, he did have something to do with the Quarrymen okay. because he was the lorry driver. Okay. <laughs> for, for the Quarrymen. Okay, there we the go. The day that John met Paul. Oh, jeez. He was the guy driving the truck that took them to the Walton Village Fate. Yeah. And as it turns out, I learned that he was still around, Mm -hmm. and I was able to write to his son, and not only did he send me a photograph of his dad as he looks today in front of the original truck that was used, uh, but he, uh, his father signed it and wrote a little note to me about that day. Mm Mm-hmm. And to me, I find that type of stuff historically important, too, because they were all part of that story. And it's the, you know, the what ifs of life yeah. uh, in terms of, well, what if, what if Ivan Vaughn didn't, uh, wasn't a mutual friend of both John and Paul? Would they ever have made that musical connection that they did in that day in July of 1957. Yeah. You know, and those kinds of things are fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, since um, since you switched over the topic of autographs, and we have we have time. So, uh, uh a few questions that I want to know. You you gave me a list here of ones you don't have, which I'll ask mm-hmm. about in a minute, but that means either you do have these or you just didn't list them or they're not important to you. So, do you have like people like Ivan Vaughn's autograph and things. Yes. Like, wow. Yeah, uh, yes, I do. He, he wrote a book yeah. because he contracted later on in life. Uh-huh. He contracted Parkinson's disease. Yeah. And he wrote a book about living with Parkinson's disease. Huh. And for the person that made out his taxes, he signed a copy of the book for them. I was able to acquire that for my collection. Wow. There are very few samples that appeared in collecting circles of Ivan Vaughn's signature. In fact, he never he hardly ever signed his complete name yeah. in books. He never tried to take advantage of his association with the yeah. Beatles story. And um in any case, I, I did get that, and okay. a former member of the quarryman who knew Ivan confirmed that it was an authentic hmm. uh, signature hmm. for me. So I love stuff like, like that, that because it's so difficult to find. Right. And, you know, you get a, like a little sense of pride. Hey, look what I can add to the collection, yeah. you know, it's... <laughs> But there's a few that are virtually impossible. Well, wait, hold off on those because I'll ask you about those in a minute. So the ones that you do have, so you have Brian Epstein's. Yes. Wow. What uh, what what is that on? Sign, a signed book. Oh wow. <laughs> and uh, you know these I all have pictures of too, and yeah. most of them appear on my blog. So anybody that would like to see it can go to my blog and use there's an index function okay. at the bottom of the page. And they can go back through the 40 or 50 pages of posts, which is literally translates to over 100 posts, okay. uh, to actually see them. Hmm. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's really, I really think that people, if they join the blog, yeah. will not only receive an education, but they will be 
very entertained by what they see. Mm. Now, saying that, let's switch over to the ones you still need. You gave me a couple here, and I'm surprised that you don't have them, even like buying a, a, a contract or something that had their name on it. Like Dick Rowe, you don't have him? I do not. Amazing. I tried writing to his son because, of course, <laughs> Dick Rowe yeah. uh, is deceased. Yeah. And I don't know if it's Rao or Roe. I honestly do not know the correct pronunciation, okay. but I was uh, Rowe, but hey. he's deceased. And why do I want him? You say to you, you may say as a collector. Well, obviously, he is the man that is acknowledged, and some say falsely acknowledged, uh, as the person that turned uh, the Beatles down at their January 1st, 1962 audition. Right. And uh, there's another person that was there that supposedly was more influential. I believe his name was Mike Smith. Uh-huh. Uh, that was actually the person that made the decision. But um, it, it goes to show you, too, that his history is sometimes limited to the person that right. has the uh, ability to talk about it. <laughs> right. The, the other amazing one to me on your list here is Alan Klein. You know, it seems like he could get, uh, you know, obtained if you got like a, some sort of signed document he had to do for legal reasons or whatever, but maybe no, that's harder I've to come never, by I've than never, not. I've <laughs> never seen anything uh, available uh, about Alan Klein. And yeah. see, that's another thing. I even collect the villains in the story. Right. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Because pe- people um, like Lou Grade. Yeah. And Dick James. Now, Dick yeah. James wasn't always looked unfavorably by yeah. the Beatles, but when the, the their catalog of songs were sold off, then there was an animosity. And so, and he was a singer uh, mm-hmm. before he became a music publisher. And right. I even have his signature when he was a singer wow. in the 50s. <laughs> and he also did... Uh, it's funny because he did a theme song uh, for the UK uh, Robin Hood right. TV series. Once you said that, I go, I know what it is, but I'll let you say it. It's Robin Hood, <laughs> Robin Hood. Da, yes. da, 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 da. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> he did record. He did record an EP, EP of four singing four Beatles songs. In yeah. 60. <laughs> I was able to obtain that too. Uh, so it, now the other the other one's kind of surprising. This one's not so surprising because I don't know if he probably was signed for anybody. Is the Maharishi? I I can't. I wouldn't say he couldn't write. It just it seems like he would be the type that. Oh, these are earthly things. We don't do this. <laughs> so it's probably yeah, impossible well, to get him. <laughs> I know two individuals that mm-hmm. have his signature, mm-hmm. but they're not willing to part with them. Yeah. So, uh, so there is a signature but, somewhere, at least. <laughs> yes, and one in in terms of writing it in English, mm. and one in whatever uh, script is used to write it in the Indian culture. Uh, so, um, but that's, again, because of the significance of the, and the impact that he had on right. their career, they were the most productive, actually, during that uh, journey to India. Yeah. Now the other ones that are surprising on here are just because they still are around, and like all the people we've talked about so far, um, you know, Beatrice McTartney, Jason and Lee Starkey. I mean, it, couldn't it just be a simple matter of writing them a letter and saying, "Hey, I'm interested in your autograph. Can you sign well, something and send it back?" Or, you know, well, be- with Beatrice, I think uh, it's, it's only conjecture on my part. I think that has to do with she leads a very, very private life, yeah. and that's the way her mother uh, wants her to not be in a, you know, to be, you know, always referred to as Paul McCartney's daughter, and right. and, uh, and you know, there's there's obviously a lot of trials and tribulations associated with that. So, um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, look at the pressures the. Not only um, uh, Sean and Julian faced being John Lennon's son, but uh, uh, Paul's son also yeah. uh, seems extremely stressed out at uh, <laughs> you know having to live up to that extreme legacy that his father has left us all. Right. 
So, but Jason and Lee Lee Starkey, uh, I've never seen anything either in eBay or any place else yeah. where I, I wouldn't even know where to contact them. Yeah, you know, so. yeah, fair enough. But it just seems like if anybody would know, it'd be you. <laughs> so it's like you know. So I don't know. Um, yeah, well, that's that's the benefit too of having been on Facebook, which I missed. Yeah, yeah. Because you would run into so many people. That's that true. I knew a person, for example, uh, there that ran into one of John Lennon's half brothers mm-hmm. in Br- in Brighton, England, which is where he lives. Mm-hmm. Okay, but as you can see, they, have you ever seen an interview with either one of them? No. 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 And obviously they have made the choice to live a very private life. And, you yeah. Know, hmm. So. Interesting. Um, other ones I'm curious, I, I assume the answer is yes, it's just how did you get them? Uh, do you have Stuart Sutcliffe? Yes. How, how did that, are these? Well, I've got, I've got two items. Uh-huh. I've got, uh, I'm, I'm, one of my goals is to get a, a Stu Sutcliffe oil painting, but the price <laughs> on those has gone so through the ceiling yeah. that it's virtually impossible to find. But I did get at a Fest for Beatles fans, mm-hmm. I got a, uh, a sketch that Stu Sutcliffe did of a pair of hands that was in one of his notebooks. Mm. And unfortunately, here's the problem with collecting. I did buy it, and it was relatively inexpensive. Mm-hmm. However, I was upset with the fact that they literally took one of his notebooks and separated it so that they could sell the individual sketches. Oh, yeah. And when you think of it being remaining as a, a single thing, it would have been much more precious uh, to, uh, you know, to be in a museum, for example, a Beatles museum, uh, which there are, they exist. Uh, uh, and that made more sense. I just felt bad that uh, I was kind of being the beneficiary of what someone else had done to his work. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that bothered me. But the other item was a poem that Stuart Sutcliffe had written in 1955, mm-hmm. which happens to be the year I was born. And so I did um, purchase that. It was on eBay. And uh, so that's um, that's where we stand with that. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um Let's see. Before we go, um, any other things you'd like to bring up, or if there's any books that are about to come out that we should probably be on the lookout for, or even have just come out. Well, there's a book coming out in April, and you know, answering questions like this are difficult because <laughs> inevitably some of these authors are members of my blog page. Yeah. So if I neglect to mention someone that happens to be coming out with a book, uh, I'm, caught up, I'm going to be frowned upon. <laughs> well, you already said there's like 50 or 60 books coming out every month. Yeah. So, so, but I'll tell you one that I'm particularly interested in. <laughs> Cut this in. guy some slack. <laughs> okay. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Is uh, Stephen Gaines, uh-huh. who wrote along with longtime Beatles associate uh, Peter Brown, mm-hmm. The Love You Make, uh, back in, I believe, 84, um, is writing a book containing the transcribed interviews with all the people that he interviewed for the book. Mm. And the reason that I'm looking forward to this book is Peter Gaines and... Uh, Peter, I'm sorry, Peter Brown and Stephen Gaines mm-hmm. were heavily criticized because of the bi- biography was considered controversial because it didn't paint uh, much of the Beatles story in a altogether favorable light. Uh, right. They dealt with, you know, the drug usage and stuff like that. However, by having the full transcribed interviews, 
you get a better picture of combining or comparing the two works. Mm -hmm. Because you're seeing, whenever an author writes a book, they're making editorial judgments about what to use, what not to use, what to emphasize, and what not to emphasize. So I want to compare the two books mm -hmm. and see if, in my opinion, they gave a realistic accounting in the first book and, and how close do the interviews with all these people gel with that narrative that they presented in the first book? Mm -hmm. And so I think that in itself is a worthwhile exercise. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. And, but people like that, like, for example, I believe Magic Alex uh, full interview with uh, Stephen Gates, I believe, mm -hmm. and I hope I'm not incorrect with this, <laughs> is included uh in this new book coming up in April. Mm -hmm. It's called All You Need Is Love. Mm. Okay. So. All right. Well, I'm going to have to log on to your blog a little more frequently just so I can... Uh, I. Uh, <laughs> Just so I can see what's coming out. And I think I was a member of that Facebook group way back when. It seems to me I remember that, but, you know, that's long gone now. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, too, sir. If you could, uh, with like, if you put, post this on YouTube, mm -hmm. if you could actually put the link there so that if people want to be able to locate the blog, they're able to do that. And I recommend that if they go, rather than just visit the blog, Becoming a subscribing member okay. is to their advantage. And the reason why, there's no cost involved in becoming a subscriber. But what it does is it provides email updates when new posts appear on the blog. And usually we average two to three new posts per week. Right. And um, to subscribe, all you do is you open up the link. Uh, you go to the right-hand side of the page, you fill in your first name, your email address, click subscribe, and you're a subscriber. Hey, I did that. <laughs> 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 well, and hopefully you're enjoying the page, yes. sir. I, ho I really, truly hope that you... Uh, <laughs> I was going to yeah. joke. I didn't receive any... No, I did. I have received many emails since, and so I'm very thankful, and so... <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> Well, uh, it was a it was a genuine pleasure to be able to speak with you today, and right. uh, and uh, like I said, I've seen several of your uh, YouTube podcasts, and uh, I, and I love them. They're well, really really good. So. This will be another one. <laughs> All right. I think we're number well, we'll two, 250 something or other. I don't know where we're at, <laughs> but uh, just keep doing them as long as I get good guests like yourself and as long as I have fun doing them, which right now I do. So <laughs> well, you're, you're a busy guy. And, yes. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, sir. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, this is our guest, John Bazzini, also known as Buzz of Buzz's Beatles Book print blog, 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 blog. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tongue twister, yes. isn't it? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, become a subscriber of his blog. Like you said, it's free. You get some cool emails every so often that just kind of say what's coming out in uh, Beetle Print World. And there are some good books coming out regularly. You'd think that, oh, we've already written every book under the sun. No, there's good books out all the time. Bruce Spizer is coming out with a new book again uh, in a, a couple months about the earliest Beatles stuff. And, you know, it's like uh, Hard Day's Night, I think, is what it is. You know, so I'm looking forward to that. And anyway, uh, I want to thank you again, John, for being a guest. And, you know, we'll have you back when, you know, some new Beatles books come out. And we'll talk again. Take care now. All right. And uh, that was uh, John Bazzini. Of, uh, and this is another episode of Fun Ideas Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Arnold. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening, and thank you, John Bazzini, for being my special guest. John's blog is called Buzz's Beatles Book Print Blog Archives and can be found at beatlesbookstore.com. Remember, you can always watch the video version of this episode on YouTube. Episode number 256 will be coming soon. If you would like to comment and or be a guest on this podcast, please drop me a line at funideas.mark at gmail.com. Become a free subscriber or a paying Patreon at Mark Arnold Fun Ideas Productions. 
If everyone listening just contributed a dollar a month, it would be a tremendous help in continuing the production of my books and this podcast. The opening and closing music for this podcast is provided by Elmo and Almo. This has been the Fun Ideas Podcast. This has been Mark Arnold speaking. This episode is copyright 2024 Fun Ideas Productions. Thank you and good night. Responsibility.